okay, now we're going to get to the stuff that's more research based where I, my particular approach is throw out everything that people promote in the literature because I don't believe it. So ampulla is a term you'll encounter often in medicine. It means flask. Um, so here's our flask turned upside down. And you can appreciate how the back of the globe here, uh, the most anterior component of the optic nerve sheath, dilates in the same way that a flask does. So this is called the ampulla of the optic nerve sheath. And you guys will encounter us making measurements often um, at a specific spot, three millimeters deep to the retina is where we measure the optic nerve sheath because that's the maximum um, dilation area. That's the area that changes the most with changes in pressure. So that's why I use this term ampulla edema sometimes to refer to like, well, you may have ampulla edema, but not yet papilla edema. Uh, the ampulla is the first place to change in uh, response to pressure from CSF and papilla edema, this bulge gene component takes much longer to occur. How long? Different for different patients. So here's just a cartoon that sort of highlights that change and the way that the uh, nerve is surrounded by CSF and arachnoid trabeculations. And this would be the kind of distension that might give you those microcysts. So on the left, we've got an MRI image. And on the right, we have a point of care ultrasound image. And sometimes you get this pushback when you talk about measuring the nerve with ultrasound. People say, oh, it's operator dependent. And is the resolution going to be good enough? So to have, uh, to get an image like this, you have to fully sedate a patient for an MRI. Because any little saccades, you know how we say, like, you have to be totally still. How hard is it for a kid to keep their eyes totally still? So they have to get an orbital, not just a head. Uh, MRI, and they have to be fully sedated if you don't want them to move. So I, my counter argument is when you think about how to do both techniques, oh man, uh, ocular ultrasound by a trained provider is so much easier to get an image that's just as good. And there's been a bunch of studies that compare MRI to ultrasound, like, well, you know, when we measure this on ultrasound, are we really being accurate? Well, the studies that have compared it to MRI say yes. So we talked about the commonly used cutoffs that you'll encounter people referring to from the literature for this optic nerve sheet diameter measured three millimeters posterior to the globe uh, is the cutoff for increased ICP. And there's been enough studies done in these areas that you have meta-analyses, systematic reviews like this one from 2015 that talk about just how well those cutoffs perform. And what I have trouble uh, reconciling is patients like me. So I've walked around with a 7.3 or 7.5 for as long as I've been doing ocular ultrasound. There was a little period there where I began to have migraine headaches and I was like, oh no, I've been saying like, I'm fine. And actually I'm not, I had an MRI. I am fine. I haven't had an LP, but I don't have any ongoing headaches. Um, <laughs> So I'm of uh, Northern Italian and Australian descent. I mean, ethnically, a Northern Italian and Irish Scottish. And when you get really deep into the literature on this stuff, you find that, okay, in Germany, when you take healthy adults and you do correlation of ultrasound to MRI, the mean for them is 5.5, essentially. These are healthy people, right at that upper limit of normal or cutoff for um, what's too high. For near uh, healthy Israeli people, mean of 5.1, range of normal going up to 8. Do you know what yours is yet? No. Do the fellows here know what theirs are yet? No. Leanne? Yeah. Self-scan. Self-scan is the best. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the group I love out of Germany has taken all of these healthy kids and set up to 7.7 .7 and correlated that with MRI. So I say throw out these cutoffs, uh, especially throw them out because there's even disagreements like this. You can say, oh, well, maybe it's geographical, maybe it's ethnic, but there are cities that are really not far apart in China 
where they find totally different things. They scan healthy adults and they say, for these patients without pathology, 5.1 millimeters is the median. And then somewhere else, they very, very close, they take adults suspected of having increased intracranial pressure that get an LP and they say the cutoff for having increased ICP is 4.1 millimeters. So how do we reconcile those things? Yeah. yeah. So how do you reconcile that? I don't know. I just say be very cautious about these cutoffs and their reliability. Um, so this is the kind of image we can get now. If I get into why I think these cutoffs are what they are and why they don't perform well, this is the quality of image we can use now for making these determinations. The papers that produced the values that you'll hear quoted show you images like this or like this or like this. Or like this, where I look at that and say, well, here's the sheath. Here's the sheath. You're just measuring the nerve itself. And then this is the new generation. This is a Steinborn image of high resolution stuff where you can be confident about the sheath. Right? I can be confident about things I see there. And just to wrap things up, so how are we going to use this if we say that cutoffs aren't useful? You're going to need to know your baseline. Who are you going to know your baseline on? Kids that have a reason to know a baseline, the shunted population, the VP shunt population. And there's the beginnings of really interesting literature. There's some case series out there where they took individual patients and they did serial measurements and were able to say, well, for this kid, like they came in symptomatic a couple of times. Uh, but they didn't cross a certain threshold for how much their optic nerve sheath elevated. And then we were able to say for them, the elevation threshold is this. So questions still to be answered. If you dilate your optic nerve sheath from increased pressure and then you decompress, does it bounce back or does it stay at some increased rate or increased size? And what's the effect of just growing up? Like, oh, you come back three years later. Your last baseline was three years ago. How much do I have to adjust your size for? We don't know. Research to be done. And other things to keep in mind, when I look at this view, I see a nerve running diagonally like so. With an optic nerve sheath that if I'm going to measure across it, I'm not going to be measuring from here to here. I'm going to be measuring in a diagonal line like that. And getting to the point where you feel confident in those uh, technical aspects takes some time. And also, I want you guys to know that there's what I think is an edge artifact effect that can happen from the ampulla that people often get tricked into thinking there's always two dark lines that run directly down from the eye. Regardless of whether the nerve is running like this or like this, you're always going to see two dark lines running down and people often measure across those because it is easy. So the nerve is running this way. It's running on an angle. But I've got a straight line coming down here and I've got a straight line coming down here. And people will put the caliper from there to there instead of from, let's say, here to here. This is why a nerve running diagonally is a really annoying to measure and you want to try to get it straight so you don't have to get tricked between those things. <laughs>